Thanks for joining us on another episode of Adaptive Adjustments. I'm your host, Auntie Nika, mental health professional, certified mediator, and founder of the youth empowerment organization, Children's in Action. For today's episode, we're going to be touching on substance-induced psychosis. This difficult time. On set, we have with us none other than Dr. Hamlet, DM resident of psychiatry attached to the Northwest Regional Health Authority. Dr. Hamlet, thank you for joining us on Adaptive thank Adjustments. You. Thank you for having me. Right, so before we go into the topic of drug induced psychosis, I just want you to tell you know, the audience a bit about yourself, what are some of your experiences, some of your passions as it pertains to psychiatry, and what made you choose psychiatry? Yes, so I do have a passion for mental health and the you know, just reducing the stigma, you know, encouraging people to get help because if your mind is well, you can, you can be well. Um, and so that's why I'm specializing in psychiatry at the moment. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. So we're going to be talking a bit today on drug induced psychosis. Yes. At this time, Adaptive Adjustments goes to the streets to hear what you know about drug induced psychosis. Have you ever heard the term drug induced psychosis? No, sir. I don't know. What's your name? Huh? What's your name? Huh? What? Drug induced psychosis. No, no, no. Never heard about that. And that was some feedback highlighting what persons knew about drug induced psychosis. Important topic. Yeah, it's a topic that affects a lot of persons. Um, yes. Some persons may or may not understand it. So we just want to give the listening audience just a general idea of what drug induced psychosis is. So yeah, take it away. Yeah, so drug induced psychosis or substance induced psychosis um, basically is where um, there are hallucinations and delusions, which is what we refer to as psychosis in this, um, in this instance, um, in people who have been, um, are currently using a substance, just finished using it or in the withdrawal state, so intoxication or withdrawal. Um, it is characterized by, as I said, the hallucinations and delusions, which are affecting the functionality of the individual. So, you know, so it has to be to the point that, that functionality is affected. They, they aren't interacting as well with the environment. And of course, it can be due to some other mental illness, etc. So it has to be purely based on the substance that they use. And the substance needs to be able to cause it. So if it's cigarettes, tobacco, cigarettes don't, you know, just plain cigarettes aren't usually associated with psychosis. But alcohol, um, um, cannabis, cocaine, you know, LSD, you know, the whole range of them, any, any drug that has this um, psychoactive component or a hallucinogenic can cause a drug-induced psychosis or substance-induced psychosis. There are medications as well that can. Okay, lovely. So I just want to touch a bit about hallucinations. Yes. All right. Um, Tell us a bit about it. What is a hallucination? What can persons expect out of it? Mm -hmm. You know, what does that entail? Right. So hallucinations are, you know, very important to psychosis. Um, hallucinations is where you have a perceptual disturbance, mm -hmm. perceptions, your sight, touch, smell, taste, um, you know, those five senses are affected. And basically, the, in order, for example, in auditory, auditory hallucinations, a person hears things that other people cannot hear. In visual hallucinations, people see things that other people can't see. And the same for the other senses, tactile and olfactory and gustatory hallucinations. Um, yeah, that's what's so that's about. So hallucinations is basically one seeing something that is not there, hearing something that is not there, tasting, mm -hmm. feeling something that is not touching, there, yeah. and touching something that is not there. Okay, how does, what is the difference? between someone having a hallucination as opposed to someone having a vision or something like that. Right, so context and, and yeah. cultural importance, is, is this is important here. Um, <laughs> they actually, um, a lot of the Caribbean or West Indian people in, in times past, you know, when they go to U European countries, oftentimes they would diagnose them with schizophrenia and psychosis, you know, because they would have this, you know, there's a general sense of um, or belief in the society about 
certain spiritual things and mm -hmm. spiritual practices and yeah. things that people see and, exp and experience. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing to recognize with any psychiatric condition is that there needs to be impairment in, function and, in functioning and it needs to be, the, the, whatever they're experiencing has to be abnormal for the culture or for the religious institution or, you know, that they are involved in. Okay. So that if you are a, um, a spiritual Baptist and you are, you know, the, you know sometimes the, there is a, a aspect of it that um, can in, you know involve Entails, yeah. Yeah, some spiritual and, and, and yeah. experience, premonitions and but a, like another spiritual Baptist, if they realize that your behavior is odd, then we know that you know something, something is, is happening here. Yeah. Okay. So somebody else who can who who knows what it's supposed to be like would be able to tell. Okay. Okay. So the difference is basically an impairment in your functionality. Yes, functionality is important. So once they are not in touch with reality yes. and they are moving contrary to the norms of society as it pertains to their behavior patterns, their understanding, their perceptions, yes. then it can be classified as a disorder per se. Yes. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Just wanted to get that out there. So guys, <laughs> now because you may be spiritually inclined mm -hmm. means that you have a psychotic or a psychotic episode happening, you know, um it depends on your functionality, depends on your level of understanding and your your relationship with others, things like that, right? Yeah. I want to touch up No, but certainly if you are experiencing something other people aren't experiencing, yeah. you know, it is a good idea to get the help, you know, talk to a professional. <laughs> okay. Talk okay. to a mental professional about it. Yeah, because most times, you know, generally, in, unless you're in a, a particular religious practice, uh -huh. generally you tend not to, you know, have hallucinations in your everyday life. You right. know, and yeah, <laughs> so just putting that out there, you know, you know, talk to somebody if you suspect that something could be odd or wrong. So once something, once you suspect that something is odd mm -hmm. or wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. seek professional help, guys. Yes. Yeah. Seek professional help. Right? Don't diagnose yourself. Yeah, don't self-diagnose. So, Doc, we want to talk a bit about, so that's hallucination, the different types, mm -hmm. right? I heard you mention delusions. Yes. Right? From what, from my understanding, a delusion would be a fixed false belief. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a bit about it. Tell the listening audience a bit about it. What can they expect if someone is delusional? Right. So as you said, that's correct. A delusion is, is this fixed belief um, that is not true. And when we say fixed, we mean that even if, when you, you know, bring evidence that is contrary to what the person believes, they aren't changing their minds, you know, they, they, they truly believe it. And so, for example, a paranoid delusion um, may be that someone is out to get me, someone wants to hurt me. Um, so if I think that Nika wants to hurt me, then that could then, you know, change my behavior towards her. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if someone else comes to say, well, Nika, why would you think Nika wants to hurt you? And they explain to me, you know, and I try to explain why Nika, you know, mm -hmm. would or would not want to hurt me and I can change my mind, then it may have just been an idea as opposed to a delusion. So a delusion okay. is where I say, no, Nika definitely wants to hurt me and I have my reasons whether or not they um, seem true to the other people around me. Okay, so they, they don't change their minds. They believe yeah. what it is and it is what it is. Yeah. Okay, guys, so there you had it. Delusions are fixed for his belief. It doesn't change based on different interpretations, different advice it's, from yeah, others. Other evidence. It wouldn't yeah, change. It if wouldn't bring change. Evidence. Yeah, so you, if someone is delusional, their belief is their belief. There's nothing you can do or say to change that at that point in time, right? And mm -hmm. hallucinations are seeing and hearing, tasting, feeling, touching things that are not apparent to other, other persons yes. right parents so yeah moving forward yeah what are some of the other symptoms or signs that we can look for in someone that is experiencing a drug-induced psychosis episode right um so you know you can have associated things like you know increased anxieties you can have aggression again that aggression might be in relation to the um, hallucinations and delusions, you know, because if the delusion or the hallucin if a halluc hallucination tells you that someone wants to hurt you and then you form a delusion based on that, mm -hmm. then that could affect, you know, behavior into aggression, etc. Um, and, and sometimes, again, oftentimes the behaviors or the abnormal things that they may do or say or react to may be, you know, as a result of that psychosis. Um, so deciding to, I don't know, something really random. Um, 
you know, just act in a random way, you know, strip your clothes, you know, just pace up and down. Again, tend to be related to that. You listen to the idea D of D type, Yes, the hallucinations. I mean. Okay, so it's just erratic behavior. Yes, behavior erratic that is behavior. not in touch with the norms of society. Yes. Right? Um, and this is in the in the context of a substance. So they're the, intoxicated right. once, with once a substance, you've used, they just used it. Okay, you know, yeah. that is when it would be associated as drug-induced yeah, substance. or substance-induced yeah. psychosis. Correct. Aggression. Some people are naturally aggressive. <laughs> some people, they, they are provoked easily. Um, and some persons may be aggressive when they drink or when they smoke yes. or when they use generally. Yeah. Does it mean that they are affected by that, or is it? Does it mean that they have symptoms, or they are experiencing a psychotic episode? Well, when we again, when we look for psychotic episodes, we look particularly for the delusion and hallucinations. They try to get to the reason behind the aggression, right? Right, mm -hmm. and and oftentimes that's where you get where you can pull out that fixed false belief for that perhaps they are experiencing some perceptual disturbance by hallucination. So, I, you know, I think it's, it's still related to that aspect of it. Okay, lovely. So, all right, mm -hmm. we have the aggression, we have the increased anxiety, we have all these different symptoms associated with mm -hmm. drug and use psychosis. Not sleeping. Yeah, not sleeping, but it has to be as a result of the drug use. Yeah. yeah? Okay, what is it about substances? As, a, as it pertains to the human mind, the human brain, what is it that makes that possible? Right. Yeah. Okay, so the way that it works depends on the substance that is used. Um, so if we can give an example of cannabis, because it's, so, it's widely used, it's widely available, it's decriminalized, you know, we can access it easily. Um, so the psychoactive component of cannabis is THC, mm -hmm. and it's um, a it, it acts on the endocannabinoid system, basically is the, which part of the reward pathway. And mm -hmm. so that's why it's responsible for the high, the euphoria that, um, that you experience when you smoke or eat or you know, consume cannabis in whatever way. The same um, THC, that psychoactive component, which is responsible for the high, is also responsible for the um, psychiatric problems, the, the hallucinations and the delusions as well. Um, and again, it would vary depending on the substance. Um, so certainly if you have higher concentrations of THC, so if you see the, the cannabis, um, if you, for instance, have a brownie and you had a whole big you know, dish of them and it was mm -hmm. a lot, um, or maybe you even have it more frequently, that then mm -hmm. increases that amount of the, the psychoactive com um, component. And if your brain is vulnerable, then you could become psychotic. Um, not all brains become psychotic um, by using a substance, any substance, but there are brains that are vulnerable. So if you have a personal history of psychiatric conditions, so if you have a history of schizophrenia, or you have a history of um, bipolar mood disorder, or an, especially a psychotic condition, or any um, mental illness, then you really should not use any substance that can um, complicate things, mm -hmm. yeah? And if you have a family history as well of substance and use psychosis, especially a first degree relative. So first degree relative means you know, your mom, dad, sister, brother. Um, if they have a history of substance and use psychosis, so if they have a history of schizophrenia or other psychotic illness, your brain may be vulnerable because there's a, a, this obvious genetic component to the, you know, the background to why um, some brains react in, 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 in a way and why others don't. Um, so it's just important to, to keep those things in mind when you decide on using a substance. Okay, you need to factor yeah. hereditary, you need to yeah. factor what are the different persons in your family and how has mm -hmm. drug use affected them in the them, past. Yeah. I need to factor yeah. in how much you're going to, how much you're using mm -hmm. and the method by which you use it. Okay. You know, these things are readily available, you can look them up, you know, um, and the frequency of use. Okay. That's important to note. Yeah. That's important to note. What are the ages that are affected by this? What are some of the persons, their ages? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how is there a difference in how a teenager would respond to it as opposed to an adult, you know? That's absolutely. That that yeah. um, any age can be affected by a drug-induced psychosis. Um, so it's not respect to a person age. 
you know, ethnicity status. Anybody could be expected because the vulnerable population exists across all the mm -hmm. groups and all, um, all statuses and all classes and, you know, all educational achievements and, and everything else. Um, remind me of the question, the age. How, how, oh, what age yeah. is. Yeah, so again, because it can affect every age. However, um, there is some, some brains, especially the young brain, is, mm -hmm. is, is quite vulnerable. Um, the teenage brain or child's brain um, really should not have any um, use of any substance. Yeah. Um, you know, and then that's really important to, to remember. So, you know, as Nika was saying right before we started, you know, parents need to, to be mindful if you're going to be using a substance. You know, you know don't use it around your child. Um, you know, separate yourself. Um, you know, just Cause be, it could affect yeah, them in the same way. Their, 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 their level of perceived risk can be affected there. And, and again, when you're very young and your brain isn't quite um, yeah. developed as it should be, mm -hmm. you know, they might be more vulnerable to this insult that a substance can bring to it. Okay. Parents, there you have it. If you are using, or you, you feel the need to use in any way, any type of substances, please stay away from the kids because they can be affected in ways more than one, right? And we don't want to have drug and use psychosis happening within the family, mm -hmm. you know, when it can be avoided. Yeah. So, you know, we spoke about the different symptoms. Yes. The hallucinogens, um, delusions, how mm -hmm. it affects them. The ages, yes, right. Um, some of the other things that I want to talk about would be the solutions to these problems. Right. How do we treat as mental health professionals? Mm -hmm. How do we treat with someone that is affected by this? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first thing would be to stop the offending, possibly of possibly offending substance. Of right. Course, so if it, yeah. it continues, yeah. you need to stop. Mm -hmm. um, so in the moment, if somebody is in crisis, they should present a. Uh, emergency department um, because some you have to to you know just to find out which substance is causing this especially if you've never had a psychotic episode before this is new or you've you, you know your relative has never had something like this happen before even if even though they've been using this substance for years this is a new thing it presents an emergency department because you do need to rule out any other um, cause of psychosis um, when if it is determined that the you know, by the test that they run and the CT head, the CT brain, the scanning, scan, right? Yeah. yeah. They and they determine that it's it's a substance induced psychosis. So you know, something substance they get. Mm -hmm. um, then we treat that. So the way that we treat um, a psychosis is with antipsychotics. And there are different classes. Um, I shouldn't say classes. There are different two different types of antipsychotics. They have the, mm -hmm. the older, atypical, first generation mm -hmm. antipsychotics, and then there are the newer ones, second generation. Okay, so how do parents or relatives, mm -hmm. if they realize that okay, their their loved one is experiencing an episode of drug induced psychosis, mm -hmm. what are some of the initial responses that you would recommend? I know you spoke about taking them to the ER, mm -hmm. but is there any other form of action that they need to take as it pertains to talking them down, mm -hmm. um, bringing them to reality, things like that? Okay, I think it depends on the situation. Um, certainly stopping the substance, if they haven't stopped as yet, will be important there as well. Um, if in the moment they are, you know, engaged in some situation, some thing that, could, that they need to be talked down from, mm -hmm. then yes, but um, as much as is possible, you try to take them to um, the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and if they refuse to go, you try to enlist the help of the police officers because they have some training in this and the ambulance services. Okay. From previous experience, mm -hmm. I would have seen that in some cases, persons come into the psychiatric hospital um, experiencing these type of um, episodes, drug induced psychosis, and mm -hmm. they would have been battered by their relatives they would have had scars <laughs> marks of violence right. things like this in uh, in their relatives response right. to their behavior right um it's important that relatives understand what is happening in a situation like this mm -hmm. because sometimes when you do the interview the initial admission and you question the relatives you hear that okay 
this is what it was they used the substance and they be, began behaving in a particular manner aggressive mm -hmm. unorthodox and they responded via violence they tied them up things like that mm -hmm. so that's the reason why i asked the question right. of you know what are some of the initial responses that parents or relatives need to engage in right because you know we want them to understand that this is not the person acting out on their own functionalities yes. this is an induced response mm -hmm. based on the use of the drug yeah so is it that the parents they need to or the relatives they need to in some instances they may not be able to talk them down you know <laughs> right that, yeah. because they may be extremely violent yeah contacting the police officers that may the be ambulance. helpful yeah. um the ambulance may be helpful but you know is it that we need to be cautious as relatives in how we deal with the situation is it that we need to exercise restraint is it that we need to you know um find other ways mm -hmm. to help the person to come down from where they are yeah you know definitely definitely mm -hmm. okay so all right i just want to touch a bit on the clinical aspect of it right i know you mentioned that you all use antipsychotics mm -hmm. as professionals you all would deal with that aspect of it from later on yeah later on <laughs> yeah but stopping the substance is imperative yes stage one yeah right helping them to understand the effect of the substance on their brain on yeah. their body yes on their actions yes also allowing them to inform us as to why they see the need to use this substance right because some persons i've had i've had the experience of mm -hmm. some patients coming into the hospital drug and use psychosis is the diagnosis yeah they spend two weeks they detox they get the necessary um, medication necessary psychotherapy things like that they go back out and by the monday morning they're back in right because they use we need i think that we need to and the family plays an imperative role in this we need to help them to understand yeah how the drug affects them mm -hmm. so there's a lot of family counseling needs to happen yeah a lot of supervision needs to take place when mm -hmm. they are back at home especially when they're younger yeah, yeah for the younger ones especially mm -hmm. what are some of the ways in which parents or relatives can engage in this you know how can they reach out to their relatives are there any specific measures in place or how do you think we can well i guess they you know substance use in itself can be um quite difficult um because a lot of substances that can cause psychosis can be addictive and that's why you would have people having repeated episodes of right. substance induced psychosis but you can have one episode you know that could happen as well um so i think we, we're kind of delving more into treating with a substance use disorder and a substance use, use disorder is usually where we, you know, you have tolerance developing and more addictive habits and, and all the rules associated with this. Um, so staying away from the drug, as I said before, is important. Um, you know, trying to employ the use of rehabilitation centers that are available. Um, you know, we have rehabilitation center, well, at least, at least the one, <laughs> SAPTC in Cora, mm -hmm. um, that's free. And then there are also other rehabilitation centers in yes, Trinidad Tobago. Yeah. So, um, so employing that aspect of things, um, I think, you know, pe relatives do have to to play a supportive role, um, and again, recognizing that sometimes the substance use, um, you know, sometimes it does get to a point where it's very, very difficult for the person to stop on their own, mm -hmm. and then that also kind of brings us a perceived risk. Um, because sometimes you, the client doesn't want to stop, you know, sometimes for some substances you say, I don't have a problem. Um, they just don't have the insight into, into the fact that there's something that's happening here. And so that insight oriented type psychotherapy, um, so employing the use of a, a psychologist or a counselor will be um, helpful here. Um, of course, there are also the NA and the AA meetings, yes, and there are groups that, yes, that meet as most well. Definitely. Um, so those are resources that can be used, that are, are available, again, to prevent a recurrence or a repeat of the psychotic episode. Um, a next thing to note as well is that once we have, when someone is diagnosed with a substance use disorder, um, we tend to treat even after the symptoms stop. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said before, or at least I alluded to, 
for it to be a substance use disorder, it has to be directly related to the substance, right? So it yes, has to be yes, most that, definitely. You know, and it, the symptoms tend to go away when mm -hmm. you have no longer have any amount of the substance remaining in the body. Um, but we still tend to treat for, you know, um, sometimes six months to a year, um, just to ensure and, and we follow up. And so the fa that follow up is important at the psychiatric um, outpatient clinics um, until we are certain that the, the um, person is doing better and they really do need to stay away from it. So if you have used a substance before and have had a psychotic episode, it's important to stop. It's yeah. important to stop. Okay, just to recap, today we touched on drug-induced psychosis. What are some of the signs and symptoms of drug-induced psychosis? We touched on hallucinations, which is hearing, seeing, feeling, touching, and tasting things that are not there. We talked about delusions, which is a fixed false belief. We also spoke about the ages, saying that drug-induced psychosis can affect anyone. It just affects persons differently based on their hereditary aspect, based on who they are and the substance that they are using, their vulnerability towards the drug-induced psychosis effects. Yeah. Right? Um, we had Dr. Hamlet on set with us today. She also spoke about how professionals deal with this issue, how you as relatives can contribute towards the well-being of someone that may be suspected of having drug-induced psychosis. The first step is to actually stop the substance. Second step, seek medical help first. Call out the police officers if we have to, once they are aggressive, things like that. Try to understand that there are signs and symptoms that are being displayed at that point in time is as a result of the drug use and not within their own normal functionality. We take them to an ER, guys, if something is happening so that they can rule out any other possible sources or possible causes of the disturbances that they are experiencing. And then from there, the medical professionals are going to send them over to our psychiatric units, which is going to afford the necessary help that they need. Yes. Yeah, have I left out anything? You have not. That was an <laughs> excellent summary. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So I just want to give you the opportunity to speak, tell the audience something, anything you want to say before we leave about drug-induced psychosis, you know, um, floor is yours. So I know that it can be very scary. Yeah. Um, if for a relative or a friend or somebody, you know, you know, you wish your friends you're lying and and then all of a sudden somebody becomes had to act very strangely and say strange things and and sometimes can be aggressive. Not all the time though, but that can still be scary. Um, so having a plan or at least understanding or coming to this session, you know, gives you a plan to deal with it. And the first way to deal with it is to get help. Right, you know, try to remove any offending um, substance that could be around the person that they can continue to use, and just call the emergency services. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Hamlet, yeah. I want to thank you for being on set with us here at Adaptive Adjustments. Yes. Thank you for your wealth of knowledge. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for helping the audience to understand what drug-induced psychosis is and how we can manage it as persons yes. you know how we can look out for our relatives yeah. that may be experiencing a psychotic episode as a result of substance use or drug use and i also want to remind you viewers to check out our youtube channel at adaptive adjustments with antinica be sure to like and subscribe to our channel guys share with persons that may need the information also we have our facebook page right? Adaptive Adjustments with Antinica, our Instagram page as well. And we also have song bites available on TikTok so that you can share 30 second clips that you can share with persons that may need this information. So I want to thank you viewers for listening. Thank you for supporting me. I'm your host, Antinica. See you on our next episode. <music>